What's up guys, Dr. Alex Tatum here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a urologist and fellowship trained men's health specialist based in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I help run our men's health center at Urology of Indiana. Today, I wanna to talk to you about something that is very important to me and something that I believe is a critical part of prostate cancer survivorship, and that is bladder leakage following prostate surgery. It's something that doesn't get a lot of press, and there are a lot of misconceptions about how both common and how treatable it is. So let's get into it. Welcome back to episode eight of The Man Cave. So what is bladder leakage after prostate surgery? Also known as a type of stress urinary incontinence, bladder leakage following prostate surgery is the involuntary loss or leakage of urine when a man coughs, sneezes, laughs, lifts, walks, runs, or otherwise strains. The way it works is this. A man's lower urinary tract has five main components, the bladder, the bladder neck, the prostate, the urethra, and the sphincter muscle. The bladder is basically a flexible tank that urine is stored in over time. When the bladder gets full, it sends a signal to the brain saying, I'm full, and when allowed to squeeze, it will gradually compress and send the stored urine through the P-tube, also known as the urethra, where it then exits the body. Now, as the urine starts to travel from the bladder to the outside world via the urethra, it will pass through two key other structures, the prostate and the sphincter muscle. The prostate is a donut-shaped organ that sits immediately in front of the bladder. It's responsible for helping make fluid that contributes to the male ejaculate. So when a man ejaculates during orgasm, that fluid is actually entering the urethra at the level of the prostate. The prostate itself is decently bulky in older gentlemen, and its presence alone provides resistance to the flow of urine. If it gets too big, it can even cause problems with a condition that you've probably heard of called BPH, or benign prostatic hyperplasia. Also, where the bladder and prostate meet is an area called the bladder neck. The bladder neck can actually squeeze to help hold onto urine or to prevent ejaculation from going backwards into the bladder and instead force it to exit out of the tip of the penis. The bladder neck does this all automatically without any sort of conscious effort. Now, just past the prostate is a small circle of muscle called the sphincter muscle. This muscle is actually under conscious control and is what we can use to start and stop our urine stream. If you're ever sitting on the toilet and try to stop your urine stream using just your pelvic muscles, that's your sphincter muscle at work. The reason this anatomy is important to understand is because it gives us the foundation for understanding how bladder leakage after prostate surgery, especially prostate removal, can occur. And as we mentioned, the prostate is immediately adjacent to the two key structures that are responsible for letting the bladder hold urine, the bladder neck and the sphincter muscle. When the prostate has to be removed, as is often the case in prostate cancer, the bladder neck, urethra, and sphincter muscle can all be affected. The connection where the bladder meets the prostate has to be removed, which essentially gets rid of the bladder neck as we know it. This means that the entire responsibility of urinary control is now left to the sphincter muscle. But the sphincter muscle itself can be stressed because it's so close to the prostate. So when the prostate is removed, a couple of things actually happen. Number one, the bladder neck, at least from a functional standpoint, is essentially eliminated. Number two, the portion of the urethra that's inside the prostate is removed. It's worth noting that this means that ejaculate will no longer come out of the tip of the penis when a man climaxes. And number three, although great effort is taken to not bother the sphincter muscle during surgery, it is now completely responsible for urinary control. It can often be stressed by the prostate removal process. Number four, the bladder is then sewn back to the remaining urethra and a fully catheterized place to allow these stitches to heal with the ultimate goal of allowing the patient to recover and control his urine stream with the sphincter muscle alone. This process actually works remarkably well and the vast majority of men will eventually heal and be able to completely control their urine stream without bladder leakage. And early pelvic floor rehab and physical therapy can improve men's outcomes even further. If you wanna learn more about our own rehab program known as Europlan, please check out the videos linked below and in the corner of your screen. 
And as a quick disclaimer to everyone watching, do not let the fear of urinary leakage scare you or your loved ones away from getting screened for prostate cancer. And if you've just been diagnosed with prostate cancer, please don't let the fear of leakage prevent you from getting your prostate cancer treated. When it comes to bladder control, the modern outcomes with prostate removal are excellent and most men won't need the treatment that we're about to talk about today. If anything, I want today's video to be an encouragement to you because although leakage following prostate surgery isn't what it used to be, even if it does happen to you, we have amazing cures to restore the quality of life that you deserve. So let's talk about the recovery process following prostate removal. What typically happens is shortly after surgery, the Foley catheter that was placed during the procedure is removed. Typically at this point, every man is going to leak urine. But as that patient recovers from his surgery, so will his ability to control his urine. And again, early pelvic rehab and pelvic floor physical therapy are important because they can help men recover even faster. On average, about 90% of patients that will regain their continence will do so six months following their prostate removal. But only an additional 4% will regain that continence from the six to 12 month period. That means that unfortunately, not everyone will recover completely. And for those men that do have long-term leakage issues, bladder control can be a major problem. Fortunately, we have fantastic solutions that can greatly reduce and even cure bladder leakage, restoring both men's confidence and their independence. So what are our treatment options? There are conservative options that are really important and that most men should try, like pelvic floor physical therapy. But the truth is most men struggling with long-term bladder leakage will need some sort of extra help in addition to this. That extra help comes in the form of two minimally invasive procedures, the male sling and the artificial urinary sphincter. They are two different solutions designed for two different levels of urinary leakage. Let's talk about the male sling first. The sling itself is a small piece of mesh that acts like a hammock. When we place the sling, we make a small opening in the perineum, which is the skin behind the scrotum. That allows us to access the urethra. We then free the urethra from some natural attachments and allow it to move easily. Then we can slide the sling into place and like a hammock, it lifts the urethra. This is really cool because it actually reduces the amount of work that the sphincter muscle has to do to hold onto urine. So instead of making the sphincter stronger, we reduce the amount of work that it has to do to get the job done. And as a patient, you don't have to do anything different. As soon as you wake up, you just pee normally. The sling is already working. In our practice, we don't even place Foley catheters afterwards. So if you can urinate in the recovery room, you can go home with no tubes and nothing visible externally. The procedure itself is minimally invasive, takes less than an hour, and is successful in up to 87% of patients. The overwhelming majority of these men will be dry. And while some men may not be completely dry, they will be vastly improved from where they started. Recovery is typically smooth with very little discomfort. We just ask that men avoid heavy lifting or squatting for the first month and a half following surgery. The sling is best when used in men whose sphincter muscle still works, but just isn't strong enough to get the job done. This typically means men who use four pads or less per day, but we'll talk more about that later. Now, let's talk about the artificial urinary sphincter. The artificial urinary sphincter, also known as the AUS, is a truly elegant solution for almost any kind of stress incontinence. It is a mechanical device that is placed internally to completely replicate the mechanism of a man's original sphincter muscle. There are three key components, the urethral cuff, the pump, and the pressure regulating balloon. The way it works is like this. Once the AUS is installed and a patient is healed, the device is activated. This means that the cuff is pinching the urethra closed and stopping the flow of urine at baseline. When a man's bladder becomes full and he feels the urge to urinate, he excuses himself to go to the bathroom. And when he's ready, he squeezes a small pump hidden underneath the skin of the scrotum. This relaxes the cuff and allows men to empty their bladder. The cuff then automatically reactivates after just a few moments. Much like the sling, the AUS is minimally invasive and patients go home the same day. It uses the same small opening behind the scrotum that the sling uses, but unlike the sling, it also requires a second smaller opening in the groin. The surgery itself takes about two hours or less and cures 88% of men. That's a very similar success rate to the sling, but remember, these are designed for different patients. Following surgery, discomfort is minimal at best. 
At the end of the procedure, the AUS is deactivated to allow the urethra to heal. In most cases, the AUS will then be turned back on in six weeks. It's worth noting that men will receive a practice pump following their surgery, and they should work to familiarize themselves with it before coming back to their first post-operative visit. The AUS is great in that it can work for men even with the most profound bladder leakage. So let's talk about that a little more. How do we determine whether the sling or the sphincter is the right choice for any given patient? As I mentioned earlier, the sling and the AUS are two very different solutions for two very different degrees of urinary leakage. For the sling, there are a handful of criteria that we look for. Generally speaking, there are four. Number one, less than four pads per day of urinary leakage. Number two is that the patient usually stays dry when sleeping, although waking up to go pee in the middle of the night is fine. Number three is, although not a hard and fast rule, a history of no radiation is preferred. And number four, the absolutely essential point is the ability to start and stop one stream when voiding. Out of all the criteria we use for the sling, it's that last one that is the most important by far. For the AUS, men can have any degree of leakage, but we do want patients to have a handful of things in place. Number one is good hand dexterity. Number two is the willingness to wear a medical alert bracelet that warns medical personnel that the patient has an AUS. That is super important. Number three is demonstrating a good understanding of some of the nuances that go along with having an AUS. That includes being willing to squeeze the button every time that you need to void, and being willing to accept that there will probably be a need to replace the AUS in about 10 years, give or take a few. Another requirement for any man undergoing continence surgery is to undergo what's known as a cystoscopy. A cystoscopy is just a quick look into the bladder that's performed in the clinic with a small flexible camera and some local numbing lidocaine jelly. This is important to rule out any scar tissue in the urethra that may need to be addressed prior to sling or AUS placement. It also allows us to fill the bladder with water so patients can empty their bladder and we can assess how well they can start and stop their stream. In our clinic, we will typically perform a cystoscopy during a man's initial visit or shortly thereafter. Although a little awkward, the cystoscopy itself isn't painful and shouldn't be something that men worry about having done. So how soon should a man pursue treatment following prostate removal? In short, as soon as it bothers him. For men when it's been less than six months since their surgery, we will frequently recommend conservative options like pelvic floor physical therapy. But if it's been six months or more since a man's prostate surgery, we will typically offer either the male sling or the artificial urinary sphincter. This is because, like I said earlier, 90% of men who will regain their ability to hold their urine following prostate surgery without help will have already done so by then, with only an additional 4% of men recovering that between the six and 12 month mark. So if you're considering male sling or artificial urinary sphincter placement, what should you expect? Well, if you're visiting our clinic, we'll typically start off with a conversation to discuss your unique situation. When was your original prostate surgery? How long has it been? And what have you tried since? Then we'll perform a cystoscopy like I mentioned earlier. Oftentimes we'll try to do this on the same day as our initial meeting, which can save patients an extra office visit, but occasionally we may have to wait until a later date. But with just those two data points of the patient's story and the cystoscopy, we can make an informed decision about whether to proceed with a male sling or the AUS. After the decision has been made, we can then work on finding a procedure date. Both the male sling and the AUS are minimally invasive and outpatient. The sling starts working immediately following surgery, while the AUS typically requires about six weeks of healing prior to device activation. During those six weeks, patients receiving an AUS are encouraged to play with their plastic keychain practice pump so they can have the best chance of learning how to use their device as soon as they're cleared to do so. Bladder leakage after prostate surgery can be a terrible drain on a man's quality of life. But luckily, men don't have to live that way. And that's the whole point of cancer survivorship, reclaiming and restoring the joy that is so often taken by a cancer diagnosis and its treatment. So if you're a man suffering from bladder leakage after prostate surgery, I encourage you to learn more about the male sling and the AUS. Check us out at www.indymenshealth.com or call today to make your own appointment at 877-362-2778. If you wanna learn more about cancer survivorship, check out the videos on our own survivorship program, Europlan, here. And if you wanna learn about how we cure erectile dysfunction, you can check that out as well. Until next time, this is Dr. Alex Tatum, signing off.